Welcome to Eat Blog Talk, where food bloggers come to get their fill of the latest tips, tricks, and insight into the world of food blogging. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll provide you with the tools you need to add value to your blog, and we'll also ensure you're taking care of yourself, because food blogging is a demanding job. Now, please welcome your host, Megan Porta. Hey, awesome food bloggers. Do you struggle with knowing exactly what you should be doing to move the needle forward in your business? And do you struggle with knowing what to focus on next? If so, if this sounds like you, I have two solutions for you. Number one is mastermind groups. There is so much power in getting people together and helping to solve each other's problems. At Eat Blog Talk, we have put together our own mastermind groups and we are hosting these weekly. You can join at any time. You can try it out for a month or you can sign up for a quarter or you can go all in and sign up for an entire year. Come join us, see if it's a great fit for you. And this will really help you to solve those problems you're having in your business and give you clarity about what you should be doing next to move your business forward. The next solution is the Eat Blog Talk membership. I have spent all of 2021 so far putting so much value inside of the membership. It is such a supportive and wonderful place to be for food bloggers. We are learning so much from each other. We are joining together in monthly intensive calls where we focus on very specific parts of food blogging in order to grow our businesses in massive ways. We also have guest experts come in and join us very regularly to talk about really specific parts of food blogging. And we get one-on-one access to these experts, such as Matt Mullen from Email Crush, Casey Marquis from MediaWise. So many great people are joining us in these sessions and they are super valuable. There are so many reasons why you should be in the membership. I could not even start touching on all of it. If you're tired of wandering around aimlessly in your business and not knowing what to focus on, Give the membership a try for free for two weeks. Go to eatblogtalk.com. You can sign up for the masterminds there and you can also start the process of getting into the membership for two weeks just to check it out. The rest of us can't wait to see you inside. What's up, food bloggers? Welcome to Eat Blog Talk. This podcast is for you, food bloggers wanting value and clarity to help you find greater success in your business. Today, I have Dayana Mayfield with me from pitchandprofit.com, and we are going to have a chat about using digital PR to rank for short tail, high value key phrases. Dayana is a digital PR strategist who helps small businesses and bloggers become the authority in their market by combining publicity with search engine optimization. Her business has been featured in Forbes, CXL, YFS Magazine, and Business Insider. She lives in Northern California with her husband and two daughters. Dayana, I'm excited to chat about this today with you, but first, we all want to hear your fun fact. All right. So after college, I didn't know what to do with my life. (laughs) And so I got really good at hula hooping. And I just practiced a ton of, you know, hula hooping tricks. It was like the the Great Recession. And I was just doing odd jobs. And I got really good at doing all of these like fun festival, you know, hula hooping tricks. I wouldn't even know how to describe them. But just the hula hoop going up and down in all directions. And and I can still bust out some pretty good circus stuff. That's so awesome. I was going to ask you if you can do the like hula hoop travels up your body to your wrist and then back down. Yes. Oh, yes. man, I am totally jealous. I've got the basic hula hoop form down. Like I can keep it around my waist for quite a while, but that is the extent of my hula hooping. That is so awesome. <laughs> so do people ask you to pull out your tricks when they come over? Especially because we live in like a Northern California hippie town with lots of music festivals. So it's like if there's a big hula, you know, an adult size hula hoop around, it's like, oh, show us what you got. <laughs> that is so awesome. Yeah. I love it. Um, and that is so different from our topic. I feel like usually SEO experts are like, you know, very like, here's the facts. One, two, three. So the coolest SEO expert ever, a hula hooper and someone who knows about SEO. So (laughs) yeah. (laughs) So let's dig into this. And I was telling you before we recorded that I don't even know 
how PR and SEO really go together. So would you mind starting by just kind of talking through that? Yes. So um, I love to help people connect these two things. So when I talk about PR and SEO, we obviously mean like um, more on the digital PR side because we want, you know, Google to know about it. So if it's on, you know, TV, that would only help with SEO if, you know, say you are on a local news channel and then they also put a clip on their website and then they linked back to your site from that post. So think digital PR because the connection is backlinks. So um, some of your audience probably knows what backlinks are already. Those are links to your website from another. So a common strategy here is guest blogging. A lot of food bloggers will you know, submit a guest blog for somebody else. And that way they gain the, you know, exposure to that other blogger's audience. And then they also get a link back to their site. But guest blogging isn't the only way that you can, you know, do digital PR. You could also do podcast guesting. You could also get covered in, you know, a great outlet. It could be the digital version of a magazine, like realsimple.com or cosmopolitan.com. So what you're getting is the backlink. And the way I like to say it is that um, SEO is like you telling Google what to rank you for. So let's say you want Google to rank you for um, paleo bowls. But then the PR is other companies telling Google what to rank you for. So if you have, you know, a recipe in an online magazine and it's linking back to you from Paleo Bowls, then that's another big, credible, amazing website that's telling Google, hey, rank this site for Paleo Bowls. They're the expert. So that's the connection. It's not just you tooting your own horn and saying, hey, Google, hey, Google. It's other companies validating and tooting your horn for you. So it's actually leveraging other platforms, right? So it's less work for you to do that. Yes. And you get kind of a lot of benefits when you figure how these things combine then not only do you get to access a new audience, but you are getting some SEO juice at the same time. So one of the easiest ways to connect these two things is to create like an optimized, um, you know, freebie like landing page, or it could be a recipe page. So we'll, we'll continue with paleo bowls. So let's say you had a blog post that was you know, 20, 30 minute paleo bowls on your website. And you then had uh, a download that was like, you know, download the recipe cards with like the shopping list. So you could, you know, do some easy shopping or something like that. You had some sort of a freebie in that blog post. Then when you write a guest post or you do a podcast interview, that's the link you give. You don't give the link to your main website Uh, If you can, you know, if you can control that, like say at the end of a podcast interview, you don't say, you know, here's like paleoblog.com. You say, yeah, I've got, you know, some some great things for you at paleoblog.com forward slash paleo bowls. Right. And so that's a way that you're connecting it where you're still getting out in front of that audience, but you're trying to control where that link is going to. Now, you can't always do that, right? If you get featured in like a big online magazine, they will typically just link back to your main site as opposed to an individual post or page. But you still get the the SEO boost because you get an increase in your domain authority. So there's the there's the little pieces and then there's the big piece. So the little pieces is like getting more links back to paleo bowls so that Google knows this is the best paleo bowl blog out there. We got to rank it. Then there's getting links to your overall website, which increases your domain authority, which can help you have a higher chance of ranking. Like, you know, Facebook has a domain rank, I think of like a hundred or 99, you know, most bloggers are somewhere between, you know, 20 and 50, but the higher your domain rank, the more likely you are to rank. So hopefully that all makes sense. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, it does. And I think like in the food blogging space, we we use a little bit different terminology, but it was good to hear. You know, it's always good to talk to people outside of the space once in a while. You know what I mean? Because you get a broader perspective. And you mentioned a few things that I don't think are on food bloggers' radars. So guest blogging is, that's something that um, is very well known in our space. People ask me all the time, can I write a guest post? And then I've also done the same to other bloggers. That's familiar. So our digital magazines, and we're all familiar with like Parade.com, Huffington Post. Um, so we're familiar with that. But I don't think that food bloggers often think to go on podcasts. I mean, maybe some do. But there are so many podcasts out there that talk about everything under the sun, right? So there's got to be podcasts about food because everyone loves food. So do you think it's beneficial to do that even if somebody doesn't really want to perfect their speaking skills or anything like that? Is it beneficial to get on podcasts? I think so because uh, you also have to think about um, the audience too. So I'm sure there are plenty of food podcasts. I mean, I, I'm obsessed with food blogs. Like I'm, I'm all over food blogs. But, you know, a lot of people probably wouldn't go to a podcast for a recipe, right? Because it's not really, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's not like visual. You're not getting like the, um, the ingredients. But you can think about it more in terms of your audience rather than the topic. So, for example, like a mommy podcast with, you know, um, tips, productivity tips, you know, organization, meal planning, things like that. Um, if you kind of, if your audience is like, you know, trying to make great healthy food in a quick period of time, then it might make more sense to be a guest on uh, those sorts of podcasts. Right. That makes sense. So not necessarily like going on a podcast to share your recipe specifically, but to talk more about the scope of like meal planning and meal prepping and making the food and maybe, um, you know, preserving sanity while you're making dinner or something along those lines, which I think we're all pretty expert. We're experts in all of that because we food blog and because we've kind of been required to do that in order to stay sane and keep our businesses running. So I think that's a great idea. And I'm really glad you mentioned that. Um, so what else do you have for food bloggers along these lines? Yeah. So I would say that um, now as much as PR and SEO do go together, in some ways they also don't because, you know, PR is great for its own sake. So, you know, if you have the chance to get featured on, you know, a household name um, online website, you know, then go for it, even if you can't control the link to your site. At the same time, your SEO content has to be really great, right? It's like you have to optimize for that key phrase and the secondary key phrases and have images and, you know, make it really easy to navigate the content. So, you know, make sure that those um, foundations are in place. And then back to like connecting them, I would say the best thing you could do would be to identify some of those life changing key phrases. So like make a list of the top 10 key phrases that if you ranked for them, would most likely benefit your revenue a heck of a lot. So it's really smart to use PR for your short tail key phrases. Um, and because those are really competitive, right? So it might be easier to rank for a key phrase that's got like four or five words in it versus just two that has like, you know, tons of volume. Maybe it's like a hundred thousand searches a month or something like that. Um, so make a list of what would those key phrases be. And oftentimes those are more like uh, the pillar page or like kind of the head of the topic cluster. I don't know if you've kind of heard of those terms, but basically just fancy ways of talking about a group. So I'll keep going with my paleo bowl example because I eat a lot of those and I look up a lot of recipes for those. Um, so if, you know, paleo bowl was on your top 10 list, then you would probably also have um, key phrases like, you know, taco paleo bowl, or um, like, I'm trying to think of something cabbage paleo bowl or chicken paleo bowl, right, there would be like other things poking off of there. But if you ranked for the short tail, like the the kind of the head of the group, then that would give SEO juice to all those other ones, because you're linking out to all of those other ones, and they can explore those 
recipes in more detail. So think of like your top category pages, your roundups, um, your short tail key phrases, make that top 10 list. And then whenever you are doing a podcast interview or a guest blog, then pick which, you know, one is the most relevant and link back to those top 10. So that way, you know, you are using PR to go for things that are more competitive. So you're giving yourself like a bigger chance. And then for your long tail, you're just doing the SEO. Oh, that is so interesting. Okay, so you're recommending like looking through your content and determining what is maybe most popular. And you said identifying life-changing key phrases. I love that the way you phrase that. So life-changing would be something that you really want to rank for. So let's say it's chili. So just making it really simple, like chili recipe or something like that and making that your pillar page. Is that kind of what you're saying? And then building things around that that are more specific? Yeah. And then building links to that pillar page. So, you know, people get overwhelmed when they think, oh my gosh, I'm going to use PR for SEO. I'm going to be so busy. You know, now not only do I have to write a post, but now I have to do, you know, two guest blogs and three podcasts for every post. Like that's not what we want. What we want is your top 10 list. So you're only using PR for things that are really both competitive and then also high value. So if it's like, you know, chili recipe, then in your top 10 list, you would put, you know, your URL and your target key phrase. So most likely the URL would be something like yourblog.com forward slash chili dash recipe. And then the target key phrase is chili recipe. And then when you're writing a guest post, you include chili recipe and then you link back from there. So then Google has all of these signs. Google has your post, which has the URL chili recipe. Then they have a link from another high quality website that says chili recipe and it's linking back to yours. So then Google goes, oh, this is the best chili recipe because it has, you know, great links to it. So just the idea of not doing it for every single post you write, but picking your top 10. And it makes more sense for those to be your pillar pages, or, you know, things that you really want to rank for, like, because it's maybe part of your brand, right? Like, it's maybe like, a recipe that's like, you really want to be known for this thing. So interesting. So I used chili because chili was something that I was literally on the first spot on Google for the longest time with my chili recipe. This was a long time ago. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. I didn't even try. And I was just there. And then it got more competitive and people started, you know, really honing in on SEO. And very quickly I went, now I'm on probably page two or three even, between then and now, what I've done is I've tweaked my key phrase to be much more specific. And I don't even know what it is now, but it's something like chili in the slow cooker or something like that. So much less competitive. Chili, though, is like one of my things. I have so many chili recipes on my blog. So would it be beneficial to go back and make that kind of a pillar post and change it back to just something really generic like chili recipe or should I leave it? I would leave it because that's a, it's a good point that, you know, in the food industry, um, there's sort of different levels of competition, right? Where it's like even chili in the slow cooker, even though that's more long tail, could still be really competitive, Um, whereas like chili is just like so competitive, it's like not even funny, right? It's just like insane. So I would still, you know, leave that, but you can use like PR, um, to retain your SEO rankings as well. So it's like, I'm sure you've heard, you know, a lot of people will update their content every six months, you know, like they might add another paragraph to a post or add some more images. So At the same time, you know, if you have something that's ranking, you could also set a goal for how many links you want to build to it per year. Um, If it's something really valuable and really important to retain, I would say to try to build four links to it a year. Um, And that could be, you know, Haro feature, like using Haro help a reporter out where you answer queries or, you know, guest posting or podcasts or pitching, you know, 
top tier media features by, you know, pitching journalists. But I would set like a goal for, you know, between two to four links per year to retain those rankings. Um, But you bring up a good point is that, you know, when I say short tail coming from the B2B world, um, you know, short tail key phrases are competitive but can be doable with PR and SEO uh, with like food blogging where you've got, you know, the whole world searching, you know, these key phrases and then these big brands. I mean, you can be up against, you know, Campbell's and, you know, uh, like these big magazines. Right. So, yeah. So maybe we want to make sure we're we're shooting for the moon, but also being realistic Um, And that can come down to like the competitiveness of the key phrase. So something that I like to do that's just an an easy way to check if I should go for something is I try to go for key phrases that have a difficulty score that's below my domain rank. So like if my domain rank is 45 in hrefs when I'm doing key phrase research, I try to find key phrases that are, you know, well below 45, if not below 30. So that might be something because a lot of people wonder, well, okay, I checked the difficulty score, but what am I actually looking for? Right. So that's kind of a quick and easy way to determine what's your cap. So I would imagine that Chile would probably have a really high difficulty score. And, um, you know, maybe when you were ranking for it, a lot of like bigger brands were kind of slow on the SEO push, (laughs) you know, and now they're putting big budget behind it. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow, I had never heard anything like that before as far as like your difficult the difficulty score being below your domain ranking. That's really interesting. Um, what else do you have for food bloggers? Because food bloggers really do try to stay current with SEO and like I see this all over the forums and in the communities and groups. This is a top thing that people want to know about. SEO as it relates to food blogging. So do you have any other tips, goodies, nuggets for us? Yeah, I would say that, um, you know, as much as like, you know, PR helps in terms of, you know, telling Google that this is worthy, telling Google that people are interested in this, you know, your on-site content still has to be, you know, really, really great. Um, and so, you know, it's just as many images as you can and the length, but also it's like making it readable, right? Where it's like putting that jump to the recipe button so that people aren't having to like scroll so far. Um, and then, you know, one of the, the kind of top things that SEO specialists are doing now is getting really, really good at adding secondary key phrases. I don't know if food bloggers are, um, you know, kind of doing that as much. Like one of my favorite tools for this is phrase.io. It's F-R-A-S-E dot I-O. There's also um, Clear Scope and Market Muse are other options, but they are more expensive. And these tools, like they don't just give you um, you know, like kind of variations. A lot of times when people are thinking secondary key phrases, they're thinking variations. For example, if you type in, you know, chili recipe in slow cooker, then maybe Google might also suggest spicy. So you're thinking like, I'm going to add that. Um, these go a little bit deeper and they tell you like just a lot of, um, like topics that you might want to add in and other words that you might want to add in. And then it lets you kind of capture more searches because when we think of optimizing for a key phrase, we think of, okay, I want to rank for this one key phrase. But the reality is that key phrase pulls in, you know, a hundred different searches because people are people. And so they're typing in whatever the heck they want, (laughs) Uh, you know, they're typing in things in their own way that makes sense to them and trying to find something and all these different, you know, like extra words that they might add. And so it kind of like, just tells you what are all of those, you know, other words that people kind of put in with that key phrase. And so for any um, key phrase you're trying to optimize for, it'll give you like 30 words that you should also include. 
Um, and then I'm sure you've seen like when you search something, uh, Google will show you in bold that word, right? Like you see on the search results page, like if you typed in chili and slow cooker, Google will show you like on the text in the search results page, like in bold where they have that. Or if they don't have it, it'll say missing, right? It'll say missing must include. Um, and so Google can show you like right before you click on something if it has that or not. So it basically kind of gives you a chance of uh, ranking for more of these, you know what I mean, imperfect searches that aren't exactly what you thought the person was going to type. And then it'll show them in your text that, yes, there is this word because Google will pick that up and put it on the search results page. OK, so I have never heard of phrase.io, but I am going to check that out. So what do you recommend for doing just basic primary keyword research? Um, I would say um, in terms of a software that's affordable, but still like, you know, has all the research aspects you need, I would say Mangles. So that's M-A-N-G-O-O-L-S, Mangles. Uh, they don't have some of the like really advanced, you know, tracking stuff that these like $100 SEO tools have, but it's $30 a month. And they have really, really great, um, you know, key phrase research features, like the ability to set your parameters, like set your difficulty score, type in some different topics, and then get all of these ideas for, you know, your primary key phrase. I highly recommend that because, you know, when you're a small, you know, business owner, a blogger, there's a big difference between $100 and $30 a month. Yeah, there is. That's huge. Add it up over a year. That's like <laughs> a lot of money that we yeah. could be spending on other things. And this is a point of frustration for food bloggers as well, because, you know, we all hear about SEM rush. Is it really worth it? It's so expensive and it's really robust. But do we even really understand what's going on in there? No, not really. Like I remember the first time I looked inside, I was like, I have no idea what any of this means. It looks cool. It looks important, but I don't know. So I've never heard of Mangles. That is um, great information. I, have for the longest time, have been using um, keywords everywhere. Also kind of dabbled in key search. And that has worked really well. Um, there's a new keyword research tool that's emerged recently. I don't know if you've heard of it, but Rank IQ. That has been amazing. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. And it kind of goes into what you were talking about as far as like suggesting other secondary keywords. So you focus on one key phrase and then it tells you, oh, you might want to also add this to your post. If you're talking about Instant Pot chocolate pudding, you should probably also talk about dark chocolate, like something really specific. <laughs> it's really good to know that because if you don't have something like that, you're just kind of writing blind. Like I assume people would want to know about dark chocolate and white chocolate as well, but I don't know, maybe not. Yeah. So that's super helpful. Yeah. And then it also lets you kind of, you know, like group more of those things into one post rather than like try to create all these different posts, which I think was like the old way of doing SEO, you know, where it's like putting like dark chocolate, putting chocolate, right? Where it's like these, like it's like really similar, but then you're just like recreating something just to hit a different variation where like the new way of SEO is really getting like more of like one meaty, high quality piece of content that can rank for those different, you know, types of searches, as long as it's still relevant. Right, exactly. And you mentioned quality and everybody says this, like you can have those really specific parameters, like you need to write 1400 words in a post and all of that. But really, quality is quality content is key. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And one thing that I like to do is try to, you know, zig where others are zagging. So like after I pick a key phrase, I look at what's in the top 10. And then I see what can I give Google that's different, because Google doesn't want to rank all the same type of thing. Because from the user experience, it's like, oh, there's not much like options for me to pick from. It's like all the same thing, right? It's not like interesting. It's not going to keep you clicking on more results and doing more research. If you see like, 
you know, every single thing is like, you know, a hundred like cute cookie recipes, 50 cute cookie recipes, right? Or you're like, you're seeing everything's like the same, like where can you pivot? So if there's a lot of listicles, you know, don't write a listicle, right? Like, you know, one recipe that is, you know, amazing, has tons of images and has information about the ingredients. Or if you see that there isn't a listicle for that key phrase, there's, or a roundup, you know, there's just specific recipes and there's no roundup for that key phrase, then you might do that. That is so intriguing. I love that because I was looking up something the other day. I cannot remember what it was, but yeah, this huge list of roundups came up and I was like, huh, that's not what I was looking for. I was actually looking to see what recipes came up. So you're saying if we see that, like if roundup style posts are what's coming up on the first page of Google, maybe to try something completely different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because once Google has something different, they will usually rank that. And like, this is something that I've done with, you know, many clients over the past, you know, six years is that zig where you were, you know, others are zagging and then you can get a ranking pretty quickly because Google is actually like, oh, cool, here's another option that we're going to put in the mix for people. You know, like one example, of course, this is not food blogging, but one example was um, like travel management. So for a B2B client of mine, travel management was like their high value money making key phrase. And all of these other companies were putting it um, on their home page, which was sort of short. So we did it on like a 3000 word guide and it like, you know, went to number one, like two months later because, you know, there wasn't something like that. So a lot of times length can help, um, but it could also just be the type of thing. Like if it's a guide, it's information about the ingredients. It's more like, you know, a story of how you came up with the recipe. It's a roundup. You can kind of think of like all of these different sorts of food blogs and then um, try to give something Google, give something that Google doesn't have yet. I love that. And I, I had just have to say this, how awesome you word your sentences. Like I've been writing notes down as you've been talking and a few of my favorites, zig where others are zagging. Oh my gosh, that's so creative. And then also one meaty, high quality piece of content because that kind of relates to food. So I was like, oh my gosh, that's so good. But seriously, like one really just robust, like something that has all of the information, which is kind of what we're doing now anyway, but just to have that in our minds, like just want creating one meaty, high quality piece of content that answers everything about X, topic X. What else do you have for us? We are food bloggers eager to learn from you, Diana. So yeah. Shed more light okay. on the SEO topic. Yeah, so let's actually take it back to the uh, the PR side because I think you know when you have that that meaty long post that is you know targeting like an amazing key phrase, then you know you're gonna want to get more exposure. So um, you know the the PR thing can feel overwhelming for people. So I want to offer a few ways to make it simpler. Um, I think, you know, food bloggers probably have guest blogging down. So in terms of, um, you know, podcast pitching, I would recommend Postaga and Podbooker as two tools that make it super, you know, fast and easy to pitch podcasts because they have like contact information and you can make your template, set and forget your uh, pitch campaigns. And then another thing that I want to mention to make the PR feel really easy is that you can get inbound PR. So that means like PR coming to you. So what I would suggest would be to make a list of say, you know, 50 relevant journalists. So like who writes for, you know, the outlets that you really want to be covered in make a list of them and then connect with them on social media and comment on their posts once a month. Because if a journalist doesn't know you exist, they're not going to be able to ask you to give a quote in an article. 
right? Or to be featured. So um, I think that, you know, connecting with journalists online and in social media is like a very underutilized way to get media coverage. And it also, you know, can be faster and more fun. It's not it's not as predictable because you're not directly pitching, but um, but it can work really well. So it could be, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, so, you know, find who's writing the article. So search, you could search competitor blogs. If you see a blog that has all these media features on it, find out who wrote the article, like search the name of that blog plus that media outlet find out who wrote that article, then connect with them on social media, then comment on their content. Um, Because a lot of people think of targeting, you know, potential customers and clients that way in the B2B world. But a lot of people aren't doing that with, um, with journalists. And it's, it's actually more of a reliable way than you might imagine (laughs) to get to get features. Oh, that's a great idea too. So could you even use that with like contributors? So I know um, some food bloggers write for, for an example, like Parade Magazine, online parade.com. So finding contributors on there who write relevant information, um, something that relates to your content and then searching them on social media and following them. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, you can definitely do that with contributors as well. And then um, on Twitter, journalists and contributors will often um, ask questions like they'll say, hey, you know, I'm writing um, like a post about like healthy Thanksgiving meals. And, you know, does anybody have any cool recipes or ideas for me? And then they'll either like just want you to reply on the tweet or they'll actually put their email. So by following these journalists, not only are you hoping that they'll see you and maybe ask you a question sometime, but you are also giving yourself the opportunity to um, kind of put your your hat in the bucket when they are asking a question. I don't know if that's the right cue. Is that the right phrase? Your hat in the bucket? I don't know. I like it. That works. <laughs> get your hat in the ring (laughs) Um, or you're something in the something but um so yeah they will often write you know things so for me like as a publicity strategist just yesterday somebody that I was following asked on Twitter um you know what are tips for small business owners looking to do PR on a budget so then I replied to her tweet but then I also used hunter.io which is an cold email finding tool. I also use that to find her email address. And then I just responded to her via email with more details than what I could put in the tweet. And so she wrote back, thanks. If I include this in the article, I'll let you know. So that only takes, you know, five minutes. But if you're doing that a few times a week, you know, you're definitely going to get featured in the media, which gives you new audiences as well as those backlinks that boost your SEO. So, um, you know, pay attention to what those relevant journalists are, you know, asking online. And you can also use hashtag journo requests. So G O U R N O journo, not journal requests. Um, and then that's a quick way to see what journalists are asking on Twitter and you can just kind of scroll through. You just, you know, check that hashtag and just scroll through to try to find anything related to food or lifestyle or, you know, cooking or meal prep or whatever uh, you feel is relevant for you. So the hashtag is J-O-U-R-N-O request. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and then that's like a thing that journalists use when they want, um, you know, they're basically trying to get responses and experts um, to answer their question so that they can quote them. Awesome. And I think the moral of the story here is just show up, like show up on those platforms and also be ready to contribute or to offer your information and know what you're offering too if they ask for something. So that's a really great recommendation. And I have one question. How closely are Um, backlinks and domain ranking related? Um, Very closely. So yeah, your your domain rank is actually not made up of how many 
key phrases you rank for, but rather um, the strength of your backlink profile. So um, that means like how many backlinks do you have from big websites? So a lot of um, SEO specialists will only collect backlinks from sites that have a DR of 45. So that's kind of what's great about the PR side of things is that, you know, these big um, online magazine versions, these online publications, you know, they all have a domain rank of somewhere between like 80 and 90, which is really, really high. So, you know, you get the, the feature, you get the coverage and the audience access, and then you also get the backlink from a site with a high domain rank, which raises your domain rank, which increases your chances of ranking for, you know, key phrases across your website. Um, so that's why I love to do, you know, PR for backlinks is because you get the coverage and it's also more fun because the alternative that a lot of SEO specialists do is backlink outreach, where you're basically just pitching people and asking them for a link. Uh, I don't know if you probably received those emails where it's like, you know, hey, we've published this great post. We'd love for you to link back to it. It has a nice infographic. Um, please link, give us a link. Like, it's like, that's really tedious. Um, it's actually incredibly tedious. And then it only gives you the link. It doesn't give you anything else. Whereas the time you spend responding to journalists, you know, pitching podcasts, like that gives you the benefit of a relationship the audience plus the link, you know? Yeah, you nailed it there, the relationship. And that's actually a kind of an unexpected byproduct, I think, of doing things like that is you create those relationships. And that is what is going to grow your business more than anything, in my opinion. Do you have anything else before we start saying goodbye? Um, yeah. So just one, you know, quick tip when you get tired of blogging, is, you know, make a video or a recording and then get it transcribed. So like I have a blog as well. And you know, it, it is tiring to keep up with it sometimes. And sometimes you just don't want to write. <laughs> so uh, when I feel that way, what I do is just record like a 10 minute video or audio. And then I have it transcribed from rev.com, which is like $1.25 a minute. So if it's a 10 minute um, audio, it'll be like 1250. And then I can just quickly edit that versus like writing something from scratch. And so, you know, that will help, you know, a lot when you're when you're in those points where you're writing about the ingredients or, you know, the story behind it, right? Obviously, that's probably not an effective way to plot out a recipe. But when you're writing the content that goes with the recipe, um, if you just need a break from the computer, that can be a great workaround. That is such a great tip. And here's another tip about Rev. You can pay, I think it's 25 cents a minute if you want the draft version. And the draft version will need to be combed through, but it's usually pretty good. I use that for my podcast transcriptions and it's so much more affordable <laughs> and we can just go through there and make all those quick fixes. So great tips. Oh my gosh, this has been really great. Thank you for taking the time for us. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Yes, super valuable stuff. So before you go, we would love to hear if you have either a favorite quote or words of inspiration to share. Um. Yes. Yeah. So a favorite. Well, actually, I just have one word. <laughs> I have one word of inspiration. And that is simple. You probably have heard people do like their word of the year. I have the word simple written down on my wall. And it has felt like really healing, you know, to not try to be doing all the things. So, um, you know, as much as this stuff sounds complicated, I just always urge people to find ways to make it simple. After 2020, I think simple yeah. is probably most of our yeah. keywords for the year. <laughs> like, yeah. yes, please. I signed me up for that. We are going to put together a show notes page for you, Diana, and we will put that at eatblogtalk.com forward slash pitch and profit. So if anyone wants to go peek at that, you can do that easily. Tell everyone where they can find you online. Where's the best place to find you? Yeah. So, um, you know, the SEO PR resource hub 
has, um, you know, insights into different services, tools, how to create your strategy. So you can find the SEO PR resource hub at pitchandprofit.com forward slash SEO dash PR. Well, thanks again for being here so much. And thank you for listening today, food bloggers. I will see you next time. We're glad you could join us on this episode of Eat Blog Talk. For more resources based on today's discussion, as well as show notes and an opportunity to be on a future episode of the show, be sure to head to eatblogtalk.com. If you feel that hunger for information, we'll be here to feed you on Eat Blog Talk. Oh, 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 o